Hello, this is Deborah Anderson, a black woman animator, coming back to you with another video. And in this video, I have Aaron Covington. Welcome. Hi. Hey, yeah, happy to be here. Uh, can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Like she said, my name is Aaron Covington. I'm a screenwriter, director. Uh, Co-wrote the movie Creed with Ryan Coogler. Worked on a number of other projects. NBA 2K. Worked on the uh, Into the Spider-Verse movie. Space Jam 2. Currently writing on uh nbc sitcom called grand crew uh yeah all righty so you're um from michigan city indiana correct correct yeah michigan city indiana how was town. it growing up it was well first off michigan city is a smaller smaller town in indiana despite the michigan name <laughs> so it's um you know it's a, like a one we had one high school and one private school that was everybody right so mm -hmm. that's like the size of it about 20 25 thousand so in that regard it was very much like had a small town feel had a, everybody kind of knows everybody you know the people you went to elementary school with were the people you graduated with and i think in that sense it was kind of like just a very american upbringing in the sense of like people were shooting for that ideal right yeah. The, the, the American dream, it was very like middle class, lower middle class. And I think that that's really what I was surrounded with mm -hmm. in kind of old school family values, Midwestern ideas and values, you know. And a lot of that is really good. But then on the other side, I know for me, I always wanted to be able to experience things that bigger cities had to offer. Definitely when I was like really young, I'd be like, are we going to move? We're going to move to the big city or something? Because I wanted to be able mm -hmm. to go to museums on a regular or yeah. see a play or just experience more culture and meet more people. We kind of, <laughs> I mean, in any small town, we kind of all get tired of each other in a way. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, you share experiences really closely and you also find a way to get a lot of time for yourself, which is definitely something I did as a kid, mm -hmm. you know, and that's where really I was able to dive into, into, into media and Obviously, TV and sitcoms are really, you know, escaping through them and seeing the larger world through media. Mm -hmm. Growing up, it was interesting because, you know, my dad used to watch all kind of movies. And my mom used to watch all the old sitcoms. So that was kind of where, like, I was uh, experiencing them on those different levels. We'd be watching, you know, Nick at Night mm -hmm. with my mom. And then did my dad do might TGI be like, Friday? we definitely did TGI Friday. <laughs> <laughs> definitely did. Any day. TGI Friday, <laughs> Martin Thursdays, Martin and Living Single Thursdays, mm -hmm. Simpsons on Sundays, you know. Mm -hmm. And then my dad would be like, man, I got this movie you got to see from the 80s. And it would just be some like random obscure movie. <laughs> or, or he'd be like, you got to watch these westerns when we sit down and watch some westerns on the weekend or something. So mm -hmm. that was a really a lot of my film education. And then, you know, high school years when I was able to hit the video store by myself, mm -hmm. spent a lot of time doing that. And, you know, I played a lot of sports growing up. So that's really, you know, for me, what makes collaboration such a big part of, mm -hmm. big part of my career and, and everything I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I wasn't playing sports, I was definitely at Blockbuster or Hollywood Video and really had an affinity for trying to watch old movies that people talked about but I hadn't seen. Again, trying to get more exposure to like the greater world and the history. So those were those were some, you know, some interesting times, some good times in that respect. Yeah. Um... I've been, I made a decision to like watch a lot of the older, you know, black and white movies and stuff like that recently in recent years. And mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting the difference between like watching a dark night and being like, it could have ended here, 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 <laughs> and here. But watching some of the older movies that are maybe the same length or a little shorter, and it's like, no, oh, this was a good ride. I didn't even notice it was that long because the yeah. writing is so good. That's that, that 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 is interesting, and interesting to notice. Mm -hmm. A lot of older movies, for one, they would just end right. Like now, movies. I don't know if it started with like the hot, not the Hobbit, the first Lord of the Rings movies. Remember mm -hmm. the the third one, and it had like four pro <laughs> epilogues at the end. It was like uh -huh. wrapping everything up, and it was really. I don't know if that started it, but at some uh -huh. point. All our movies, especially the big blockbusters, have to have these long endings to make you feel safe and like everybody's going to be okay kind of thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of old movies, they'll just be like, 
this is the end freeze frame or cut to black and it's like <laughs> all right we out of here it does, right it does feel like the end of the story but it doesn't feel like a resolution mm-hmm. but a lot of times it's 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 really it's not there's nothing missing from that feeling you're like oh that that was the end of the story so i do appreciate that a lot about old movies i would be curious about the points in dark knight for example when you were like it could have ended right here, you know. And it, it just was right so there. long. Like I just yeah. and, it, and it just didn't need to be that long. And then um, when you when I think about um, Black Mirror, like you know, Americans' obsession with like five hundred episode, like five hundred season, ep- like five hundred episode seasons, uh-huh. and uh, the first two seasons of um, Black Mirror were like three episodes. Um, and I feel like what because I feel like those first two seasons were a little bit more pure where it was like just this british show and then once americans started getting interest interested that's why mm. the third season was like six episodes because it's just like oh the americans need more episodes and mm. then i felt like with the first two seasons of black mirror it would i liked it better because you had to figure out what the point was but then as soon as americans got interested it's like oh we got to tell them what the point is because <laughs> mm. some of them can't figure it out so <laughs> Yeah, I wonder what their model is mm-hmm. because for a team of writers to only do three episodes, I wonder if it's really just one or two writers when they did mm-hmm. that because financially, you know what I mean? Like you work in TV, you'd be like, let me get a couple more episodes, you know, because <laughs> people get paid per episode or paid per yeah. week. But I definitely see what you're saying and that a lot of BBC shows have that shorter model. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I had a Facebook status a couple weeks ago. Like, if y'all are getting more into British shows, it's not going to have 20 episodes in the season. Um, yeah. You're going to have to get used to shorter seasons. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, there's a definitely a place for both, but, mm-hmm. and they both have their, their, their pluses and minus. Yeah. Minuses, you know. When I'm thinking of TV shows now, or trying to think of a pilot or a show idea, it is tough to think, like, okay, how many episodes what I want this first season to be Mm -hmm. and sometimes you're like just looking at the landscape and maybe comps to your show but a lot of shows now are getting like six episode first season runs Mm -hmm. but even in the past like the office first season is like six episodes Seinfeld's first season is like maybe eight episodes Mm -hmm. and then when you're working on the show and you're like oh we got you know eight ten episodes then you see another show with like 18 or a traditional Mm -hmm. 22 and then you're thinking like, and people are having a good year. <laughs> <laughs> Financially wise. <laughs> yeah. Um, what are some of your best childhood memories? The neighborhood I lived in was um it was kind of the circular, like oval <laughs> of houses. Yeah. And like there's an elementary school behind us. But it wasn't like a cul-de-sac or anything. It was just like because we were close to Lake Michigan. Mm-hmm. So the neighborhood or I lived in a couple in the area kind of like dovetailed into like the street around the lake. Yeah. So there was like, you know, the kids that lived in that neighborhood and back then we were all around the same age, right? Mm-hmm. So we had a lot of fun in that regard, playing basketball or playing with water guns or baseball or bike riding, kind of the things we did for fun just within that neighborhood up to like, you know, before people started getting cars and and things outside of that neighborhood. Those were some mm-hmm. real fun times. A lot of time playing basketball and my family, we were able to go on vacation a few times. Nice. Oh yeah, my mom who grew up in the Midwest, but my mom's family was from Baltimore. Okay. So a lot of summers we would drive to the East Coast. Those are good times and good family time. Mm-hmm. Coming to the East Coast and uh, visit that city and then visit DC and do things around there. Uh, what is your um, cultural makeup? And that's not to say what's your eth- ethnicity, but all, uh, but what is the culture of where you grew up? You kind of already went into it, but what is the culture of where you grew up and the uniqueness of where you're from? Um, let me think. Yeah, Michigan City was interesting because, well, without knowing statistics, so nobody can come at me. I don't know statistics, <laughs> but it felt very much like a black and white city. Mm-hmm like 50 50 that's what it felt like right growing up mm-hmm. like my elementary school was all black all black when i was there we had like three 
one to three white kids per class. Everybody mm-hmm. else was a black kid. Mm-hmm. You know, so then middle school, junior high, high school, it was like pretty split, you know, mm-hmm. and it was more split by like maybe the classes you took or what you what your trajectory was if you, you know, were thinking about college. You know, in a small town like that, uh, you know, for a long time I thought we were all, because I was definitely groomed to be like, okay, you know, you're going to go to college and yeah. get a job. My parents had both gone to college. My mom had finished college. My dad had moved back. He was from Gary. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they were like, well, you know, you guys got to go to college. And me and my sister were good students and everything. But in a smaller city like that, are not a lot of people. It's not the majority thing that everybody's just like, we're all going to go to college. Yeah. You know, that can kind of separate you. Mm-hmm. In that regard, it is really interesting how my experiences were split as I aged you know yeah. it was like around all, all black people then high school some of the ap classes you'd be like it'd be me and one or two other guys or girls that were black students in some of those classes you know but it was very like i said very midwestern very like i guess what that means is like whatever it is in reality in people's minds it's like oh you know traditional american like salt mm-hmm. of the earth you know at that time basically people trying to get along Mm-hmm. valuing community and family even if that's not how people act all the time that's what they <laughs> say they value you know right and you know there's a lot of like i think i was lucky because my dad was from gary mm-hmm. and like i said and my mom was from baltimore that we weren't a super insular family the way like you know a lot of people's like grandmas mm-hmm. aunts uncle like their whole family was in or around that area Mm-hmm. So people were always having, there's always some kind of dramas, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I kind of didn't grow up didn't grow up with that. So I think, I'm a pretty calm person. So I think part of it is <laughs> I didn't grow up with a lot of like family drama around me, that kind of mm-hmm. thing. But it did just allow me to observe, observe a lot of things and a lot of human behavior and stuff, which, you know, if I'm crafting a narrative and thinking about it now, definitely informs where I'm at now. Yeah. You know, and then just growing up like that is like, oh, yeah, um, I want, you know, I want to do content that's black forward and mm-hmm. and, and for black people. Cause that's that's who I was growing up, you know, yeah. looking for that kind of content, watching any show with, with with black people, all the sitcoms and all the shows just to just to kind of get that experience. Mm-hmm. You know, that, you know, we're still trying to, uh, I guess, like even the playing field today in that yeah. sense. So mm-hmm. I'm still part of that, or that's what's embedded in me. Yeah. From where I grew up. Um, I feel like with me, like living in different parts of the country and like also visiting other cities in the Midwest, you know, Midwest is very industrial. <laughs> like, yeah. Very yeah. Like, concrete. <laughs> for sure. Um, and it's, it's interesting for me being like from Detroit and I remember I know like sometimes I watch like social media videos of people um from Detroit too but you know they might live in LA but they go back home and I'll see the background and be like oh that's Detroit because I it's a brick house <laughs> like like that that's what I always wish growing up growing up like that was one of my dreams like the to, for, for my mom to get like one of those vans with the bed in the back <laughs> <laughs> with the TV and have the TV like the it, those vans with the ladder on the back like the ladder on the, oh on the outside goodness. with the yeah. circle I wanted her to get one of them and then like I wanted to grow up and get a brick house <laughs> brick house <laughs> that's living it, high on the hog <laughs> cause it's sturdy you know <laughs> yeah. and fancy yeah mm-hmm. but then you move other places and they don't really have big brick houses like that <laughs> they don't appreciate the brick <laughs> right <laughs> No, for sure. Midwest is very industrial. You know, mm-hmm. my dad worked at the steel mill, mm-hmm. you know, and his dad did. And a lot of people worked at some manufacturing plant that I knew or, you know, something. Yeah. In that area, that area of Indiana, Northwest Indiana was heavy like that. I know Detroit was obviously heavy car like industry. that. Car uh, manufacturing. Yeah. yeah. Like a, a lot of my family members have worked for GM Ford or some other right. company. <laughs> And that was a big part of it. That gave people like a feeling of security, and mm-hmm. you know that's what even allowed my parents to be like, "Oh yeah, you sh- plan on going to college because yeah. you know my mom worked at a at a hospital, so that they were able to find pretty secure jobs, and you know that made what was maybe 
a mid lower class experience feel like a middle class experience, especially in a town like yeah. that where it's like yeah. some divisions are big and some divisions are kind of small because you can only live so grand yeah. in a small city. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> there were kids who'd be like, "Oh, they got money. His parents, their parents are lawyer," and it was like, "Where are they living?" Because if they live in here, it, it's it's not that fancy, like, no matter where it is. You know? <laughs> right? Did you have a favorite like tradition growing up with your family? I mean, I guess just just the holidays at different mm-hmm. times. As a, I, was, I remember elementary school, I, I was never a big fan of Halloween, but we used to do costumes, and I was like big into wrestling. Just mm-hmm. do a lot of wrestling costumes, wrestling uh, guy costumes. Mm-hmm. You know, and then later, like when my sister left for college, we would do Thanksgiving different. Like we, we might order a different food, or one time we went to indianapolis for a basketball game like that they mm-hmm. you know they would do thanksgiving day or the day after games so we started doing different things that was fun yeah yeah so what would you say your journey um in writing and creativity was during your childhood it wasn't really anything focused it was just the soaking up of stuff for the occasion to indulge like i mentioned from renting a bunch of movies and old movies but you know that was kind of the other part of growing up in a town like that i think and people might have different experiences or it depends but it wasn't really a lot of exposure to the possibility of that you know me and my buddy brian used to draw a lot as like young kids but i Mm -hmm. never loved drawing like that yeah um and then we used to play play games and stuff and make up scenarios and things so that was always fun i guess that was like the beginning of storytelling yeah but i didn't know i wasn't headed in this direction necessarily you know yeah. up until about seventh or eighth grade I, it was just like oh basketball and i'm a i'm a, I'm a really tall dude mm-hmm. so a you lot are. of people were like oh yeah <laughs> I can well, confirm. You know, <laughs> me and other people were like man you know basketball is a ticket but yeah i didn't develop athletically like that so then the rest of high school it was just like fantasizing about just going to college just yeah. if anything as a means of exposure and and escape uh and it wasn't really till college that i was like what does it mean to make entertainment in some way mm-hmm. what does it mean to write a movie and things so growing up i would say and i think some of this is a good thing to be like i was able to just consume the entertainment without any like extra work in my mind about i want to yeah. do this or this could be yeah. it was just like pure fandom or pure just yeah this joy you know and really really soaking it in mm-hmm. which i think allows me now to look at things objectively to take you know to have an industry brain that's like this is what i want to do this is all watching this but also have a fan brain that's like yeah do people like this <laughs> will anybody <laughs> watch this yeah. would i watch this you know yeah i think that's, we... a, that's actually a big advantage go ahead yeah, when, with me going to uh, film school, they kind of told us freshman year, like, you'll never enjoy a film ever again. <laughs> but I can luckily turn it off. Like, it kind of goes, it kind of clicks on, clicks off. Like, usually I can just enjoy some. Well, I'm very analytical, so I'm analyzing naturally anyway. But mm-hmm. usually I can enjoy something from a fan standpoint. But sometimes it clicks and it's like, why did they do that camera shot? <laughs> like, this is so right. good. <laughs> like, like, um, what's the, uh, the movie with, um, Viola Davis, where she was with the four wives or something like that. I um, can't remember what that movie was called. Not the help. No, 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 no. Like it was, the, they were like, were trying to. I don't know if they were trying to kill somebody. I don't know, but she. It was like uh-huh. her and three other wives or ex-wives or something. Widow, like widows. Yeah, widows. Yes. Oh yeah. yes. Widows. And um, there were a couple times. Like there was like, was that the movie where there was like this shot where. They were coming from behind like a, a a wall and then it was just like a shot across a car and i'm just like y'all just did that to be interesting there was like no purpose yeah. in that shot <laughs> like, yeah. like so you hey. can tell when some people are just like oh i'm just to do this cool shot and this was like what was the point or um sometimes the cinematographer's got to get his real tight <laughs> you know <laughs> and then was it widows or some other movie where you're looking at you, the um the camera is is where the uh hood a uh, hood um what is that called hood emblem hood whatever oh uh, 
on the car. It's on the hood ornament. It's like the camera's yeah. where the hood ornament will be, but it's pointing at the car. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what movie it was. I don't know if it was Widows, but like they're talking in the back seat. There's they have a driver. They're talking in the back seat, and you just are looking through the window at them talking. And I'm like, normally, you know, in normal that you would go inside the car at some point. Yeah. I think that was Widows too. <laughs> yeah. And so like a crazy yeah, shot like that. Yeah. The, you got mad beef with Widows. <laughs> we're finding out. This is when my like it clicked in. And so they're like looking at the passenger side side mirror and then they just like pan over to the driver's side mirror. And I'm like, why are we looking at the outside of the car? <laughs> like yeah, I remember I remember that actually in that movie. <laughs> It was strange. It was strange. <laughs> so it's like people are like trying to break rules, but they don't make sense. <laughs> you know, you got to have that f spirit of of rebelliousness or yeah. like adventure or risk taking. I think mm -hmm. to be a really good filmmaker, and then you try it and <laughs> see what the response is. I know I've definitely done some shorts and things, or even yeah. in the writers' room, you like write a scene a certain way or you mm -hmm. pitch it and you're like what y'all think and then it's like i mean that was a good effort but <laughs> good on you go yeah. <laughs> didn't quite go over the way you wanted it to. <laughs> right um so like what did you major in in your undergrad and how did you decide to go to usc usc for your mfa undergrad i went to ohio state the ohio state University. <laughs> of course the yeah. i'm not a michigan fan so i don't care but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a Michigan it's, or a Michigan State fan. I'm just like, uh, I just want, I'm just from there. <laughs> you know what? It's kind of the thing. Like, if I don't say that, then somebody else would be like, the Ohio State. No, right. Like, yeah, yeah. The, Let me the, just the get Ohio, it out. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> but, you know, when I went there, actually a minister from my hometown was like, not mentoring me, but we were having conversations at church. And he was like, you know, business. It's going to explode internationally, blah, blah, blah. I was like, man, that does sound true. So I went in Ohio State as a business major, looking at international business. Mm -hmm. But I just didn't have any 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 real passion for that. Yeah. So after my first year, I was undeclared. And it was actually, I always tell the story on, it was a long, so the distance from Michigan City to Columbus, Ohio, it's about a five to six hour drive. Mm-hmm. So go to, I think to my sophomore year, I was just like, let me pick a major. What do I want to do? Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, maybe I want to try to make movies. I don't really know even how I got to that point, but I was fairly confident in writing skills just from a few teachers. Yeah. And like, oh man, you know, you write really clearly and we know, you know, you're pretty, you know, you're not bad. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really any more encouragement than that. Maybe even it was just like on a specific paper. They weren't like mentors or anything, but <laughs> yeah. I took just a little kernel of a compliment and mm -hmm. was like, and at that point it was big with like, you know, obviously Tarantino was already big, but like Kevin Smith, mm -hmm. Rash, Clerks, all these kind of indie movies had already like exploded. So it was like, oh, this may be a way to make movies wherever you are, right? Yeah. So on this long drive back, I was like, I'm going to see if I can gain the skills to make like a movie, like a Clerks, right? Like, yeah. He made, he made that. We could, you know, me and some people could make that. Mm -hmm. Not that that was just my only goal, because I was also like, man, look at what John Singleton did. He just wrote a script. I could write a script and find somebody to send it to if I learn. And so I decided to do that. But Ohio State didn't have a film program. Mm -hmm. So I switched into communications as a major because that was a major that had internships with news companies. Mm -hmm. And I knew to make the news, you need a camera. You got to do some editing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's some yeah. storytelling there. So I went to that major, had a couple internships that I wasn't particularly good at because <laughs> news is kind of boring. And yeah, I really just didn't understand also like about going to that level of a job every day. Yeah. Also with the news, I, I got an internship with the sports department. It's more freewheeling than you think. Mm -hmm. Like they kind of show up when they show up for the show and you over tape but like some people are there early it's it was just less structured than i was really ready for yeah but still i did it for a semester and i still got a, quite a bit out of it mm -hmm. so then i was looking at you know i was oh and then so well, <laughs> the story's kind of winding <laughs> it's okay. but let me just let me just clarify <laughs> so i came in them like middle of my second year and i was like okay communications i get these try to get these internships and 
I worked with some cameras, and then some students put together an organization called Real Buckeye, R E E L, mm-hmm. where they like we're gonna write a script and shoot a movie, which they did. I found out about it kind of late. Mm-hmm. They were like, well, we need a behind the scenes crew, so anybody that comes to this meeting can do behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. And like seven, eight people came to that meeting, and we got to schedule. We're like, we're gonna show up whenever they're having meetings or auditions, and we're gonna start behind the scenes. Yeah. So we started that, and you know, after a couple months, it was just me and another guy. Mm-hmm. And then there was a third guy, this guy Carl, who who was kind of in and out. And then after a few months, he was like, "I want to do this." Yeah. And then it just became me and this guy Carl, this white guy Carl, who's a real cool guy, mm-hmm. who ended up going to USC later in a doctorate program, which mm-hmm. maybe I'll get to later. Mm-hmm. But we made a documentary that was behind the scenes of that creation. But because, like, it was just students making it, we just couldn't get a lot of content. Yeah. And Carl knew a lot of people in Columbus, so we ended up linking up with a, quite a few people that had made that were making, like, those small indie kind of films. Yeah. This one guy, I think Peter John Ross, was making, like, indie horror movies, like historical mm-hmm. horror movies in the woods of Columbus. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and this other guy, this black guy, man, I can't remember his name, but he was making, like, martial arts movies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In like local warehouses and stuff, like really interesting people that had a chip on their shoulder from Hollywood for some reason. Cause I'm like, yeah. y'all ain't never even been there. It's like, <laughs> what's going on out there has nothing to do with y'all, what y'all are doing. They're not like rejecting you. You're not really in that game. Yeah. But what you're doing here is also like inspirational and cool. So mm-hmm. our doc expanded to being like about just a burgeoning film community and people with the interest in film in and around Columbus, Ohio. So that was yeah. a lot of fun. And when we screened it, we actually <laughs> screened it separately from the student film. Mm-hmm. Like we ended up being our own thing. And we yeah. had a, they had a screening like at the local theater, but we had our screening on campus at this place, the Wexner Center, mm-hmm. <laughs> which was kind of like made it a bigger deal. Yeah. It was now like university backed and it had this kind of prestige around it. Mm-hmm. Just, just in Columbus, just on campus. It's not like the whole city was buzzing, but. Right. Everybody that we interviewed came and, and pe- people that worked on the student field came and some teachers and stuff came. Mm-hmm. And we didn't com- campaign or anything, but shortly around that time after that, there was a film studies minor that was introduced. Nice. And so I took some of those classes, finished school, done with school. I got a job in Columbus at this place called Mills James Productions. Mm-hmm. And that's just like a local production house that does local commercials. They film a lot of things at Ohio State. Mm-hmm. Just for example, like if somebody's retiring and they want to make a video, yeah, they call a professional production company to do all the interviews and stuff, car commercials, product ads, even like still photography. And then we would do the Ohio lottery show, which was a big thing. Mm-hmm. I believe once a month, you have to like build the stage, wrangle the audience. I was kind of PA and camera assistant and at my time at Mills James, which really just taught me how a set runs. You know, a lot of those guys in the production unit, field unit, we used to hire a lot of freelancers. So when like companies would shoot movies like in Cleveland, a lot of those guys would work on those movies. Yeah. And then during the year they would work freelance for Mills James. So I got to meet guys that have been on like big movie sets and things. Mm-hmm. And everybody was just really professional and really good at their jobs and real tech heads, mm-hmm. which I'm not, but I got that exposure to it earlier. Mm-hmm. And around that time I was thinking, okay, what do I want to do? I'm not kind of knew I didn't want to stay in Columbus at that time. I'm, I'm not even from Ohio. So it's not like I had a family yeah ties so then i was like i'm gonna apply to grad school started doing the research and the time i was doing it i took the whatever graduate test is i can't remember now gre yeah and Mm then uh, usc was the school that offered a winter enrollment Mm -hmm. i had missed the time i took the gre and the timing i had to wait another few months to apply at like nyu or afi and really afi i wouldn't have gotten in anyway because you really have to have more experience to get in there yeah. But I applied at USC and a lot of that application was like writing, kind of like how this interview is, but it, it was like, <laughs> you know, write little essays. Yeah. Uh, so I think I was able to just hold my own mm-hmm. in that part of it. I had a decent enough transcript and I had the stuff, like the production experience from Mills James and we had made that doc. I sent like a DVD of the doc, which I'm sure nobody got or <laughs> opened or anything. But in your mind, you're like, this is just bolstering my resume, boosting my resume, like right. going right to the top. Anyway. <laughs> and I got into USC, and we started January 2008. Nice. Yeah. And that was a class with me, Ryan Coogler, you mm-hmm. know, Gerard McMurray, and, you know, a number of other people that 
are still working in this industry, working good jobs and, you know, high level positions in this industry. So you weren't able to get too much into comics um, in your formative years because of you were from a smaller city. So how was it get to get more into them in college at a later stage in life? It was great. Mm-hmm. I, I think that maybe there is something I missed about being able to follow things as a kid and like get into it and have that feeling of wonder or whatever. Yeah. But luckily, growing up in the 90s, they were all on TV also. <laughs> yes. We had the greatest cartoons, X-Men, mm-hmm. Cartoon, Batman, Superman, I've Spider-Man cartoon. I've interviewed Larry Houston, who's, who's the b- director of uh, X-Men animated series, and I inter- interviewed uh, John Semper Jr., who was a writer for Spider-Man the animated series. Wow. Black those, people. I mean, those guys really set set the table for all of us to be able to experience like all of this. So, yeah, my background was more in those cartoons, yeah. that animation. But getting into the comics as basically an adult, it's funny to... <laughs> It's funny to call college students adults when you're older. You're like, we weren't, we weren't adults. Right. What, what were we doing? But I think it, would, it allowed me to have my eyes open mm-hmm. to the different levels of tones that existed mm-hmm. in the comic. You know, the shows were always pretty consistent. Mm-hmm. Batman is Batman. But when you get in the comics, you're like, oh, this Batman is dark. I'm like, oh, this is a little lighter. Now they do it more. There's more cartoons now, so they can have different shades yeah. on the characters. Mm-hmm. But getting into them older, I really could see, start to understand what not only the medium could do, but yeah. what the characters could do. And it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, the character can be different things at different times, which I do think feeds a lot into like the IP reboot culture we're in now. Yeah. And I think there's, you know, there's something good about that. The character can be rewritten to suit you, and nothing is set in stone. Mm-hmm. I think I started to pick that up. Mm-hmm. Once you started go- going going more to more of the artistic um, pathway, were your parents supportive of that? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, when I grew up, me and my dad haven't been in greatest contact. Mm-hmm. But my mom never. Well, she didn't. I don't know. If she really always knew what was going on. <laughs> I was just like a steam train. Like I'm applying to grad school. I'm going out to L.A. This is yeah. Kind of, what's happening uh but she was never like she never like pulled back or was like are you sure she was just like you know tell me about it and i would tell Mm -hmm. her what i was trying to do or what i thought it could lead to and i think she you know even was getting excited about it Mm -hmm. the possibility maybe that's just the way i framed it i was excited about it she was like oh that she's overwhelmingly excited (laughs) i'm going out there and make movies i'm gonna make cartoons she was like oh man (laughs) Maybe she should have been like, uh, like <laughs> right away, yeah, right. right away, as soon as I get out there. You know? <laughs> Don't want to qu- squash your dreams, my baby. <laughs> <Right. laughs> she was always very supportive. I think, you know, for me, with my parents or anybody on the outside looking in, it was like just a question of what, yeah, when I was going to find a thing to dive, to dive into. Mm-hmm. You know, I think people generally trusted me and trusted my decision making. Mm-hmm. And and once I found a thing that I knew I was going to give all my energy to, you know, my mom was like, then just, if anything, it's just like, don't hold back. Yeah. You know, go all the way. And, you know, we used to always talk about what if, you know, if it doesn't work out. Mm-hmm. And kind of not necessarily forming plan Bs or talking about it like that, but just like you give it your effort and then you pick yourself back up mm-hmm. if it doesn't work out. And there are other things you can do and you can be capable. But if you don't go for it, you know, I don't know if that's all, even always good advice. I don't always like to say things like that because mm-hmm. it doesn't work like that for everybody. And yeah, I understand that, that I was lucky at a lot of times and in the right place at the right time, things that you can't account for. But mm-hmm. there was definitely a mentality for me to be like, if I'm going to go for it, let me see. OK, I'm going to take the GRE and apply. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to try to do my best at those. I want to get in. Right. Yeah. And if I don't, then I'll do something else and. I was always like, I can always write a script after work. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think that, and it is tougher than just saying that, but I was still of the mindset that I was going to maybe make it one way or another. My plan B is usually included how I was going to be creative, right? So it was like, okay, uh, if I don't get into school, I'm working at this production company. Maybe I can stay here or get a job in the front office there doing like some associate producing. Yeah. If not, I'll get another job 
you know, big guy could do security. Um, I had worked at a hotel for some time. I was like, there's other jobs I can do. And then write. And if you write something, you know, eventually maybe you get good and you can get it published or mm-hmm. you can get it a script. But then I got into school. So then you're into school and it's like, okay, I got to take out loans to get there, which was daunting and continues to be. But <laughs> <laughs> like while I'm here, I got to get something out of it. I got to make the most of this time and opportunity. So, yeah. you know, we do that and, <laughs> and school is out and it's like I'm in L.A working finding different jobs before creed but even then it was like okay what what can i do you know i was doing writers groups and yeah i was doing improv to meet people in the comedy scene Mm -hmm. because i knew i wanted to do sitcoms too and just my plan b is always included like making a time in my life to try to further this as a career yeah because this is this industry is totally maybe more than any other it's it's no matter what you want to do it's a hobby first yeah. <laughs> you have to love it as a hobby because you're not going to be getting paid. <laughs> yes. So it's like, yeah, it's a hobby first. The writing has kind of got to be kind of a hobby. Mm-hmm. Then you get some traction, then you get paid, and then it's a job. Yeah. And that's kind of almost any job in this industry, even just like being on set, you want to be a gaffer or something. You mm-hmm. got to do some free stuff and make it mentally call it a hobby or something first. And then yeah. you make the connections to getting a job. Yeah. Um, you listed um, a lot of your uh, projects in your intro. Um, you also wrote in comics, Edge of the Venomverse, and multiple like Black Panther comics. Yeah. You have some experience in like sound design. Like, was that just something to do? Was that a passion? And how did you go like from sound design to the like was was writing the, always the thing, and just sound design was something to do. But yeah. Stone. Well, kind of sound design happened pretty much just in film school. Mm-hmm. And all the sound projects I've done were student projects, yeah. somebody's thesis or, or group project. And what it was, was at school, after like your second semester, you start doing advanced projects, which just are like 12 minute projects. You go from yeah. five minute projects to 12 minute project. Mm-hmm. And me and Ryan did sound, me and Ryan Coogler did sound on a project. Yeah. That first semester we were eligible. Mm-hmm. And part of the thinking was like, we won't really be doing sound. It was always to write and direct. Yeah. But here we can just learn how everything falls down. And we had great sound, te- like great, great sound department at USC. They still do mm-hmm. amazing equipment, some great teachers and professors. And we just took the opportunity to learn from one of the top departments there and to learn how everything falls to the sound person. Mm -hmm. Every mistake, sound picks it up. Mm -hmm. One way or another, even if it's in the script, because you're replaying a line so much when you're doing the dialogue editing, you're like, this line was bad. You actually become a better writer dialogue editing. Nice. So so it it, it was really just kind of to learn and take an opportunity at USC, not just to be always like, just heading in one direction. It's like filmmaking is a lot of things. Yeah. And then after doing that project, you have like the skill set and they trust you with the equipment and just an effort of helping out friends and and, and even trading favors, yeah. which I didn't get I didn't get paid back on a lot of them sound gigs. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> people still owe, but <laughs> pay me what you owe. <laughs> you know, people would be like, I'm doing a thesis. I need a sound person. You know, you make friends with everybody. And it's like, yeah, yeah I'll come out for a day or two or oh, it's a five day shoot. Yeah, that's. When you're young and have energy, it's like, that's just <laughs> no problem. I can rent the equipment because they know I've done it. And yeah, so that was really all, all sound was. And mm-hmm. it was a great education. And if you look at even Ryan's movies, mm-hmm. he's always done interesting things with sound. Yeah. But I think, you know, because he's had that background and is is it's part of it because he knows what's what's possible, you know. Can you? But the comic, you mentioned the comics. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the comics were a lot of fun to do. Um, it's a different feeling seeing the ideas drawn mm-hmm. than it is seeing like dailies footage or something. It's it's really incredible. Yeah. Uh, and I hope to do some more in the future and mm-hmm. create some soon. Yeah. Um, can you just kind of talk about your relationship with Ryan Coogler and how it developed and just what it's been this whole time? Uh, yeah. We're, you know, good friends. We met at USC. We started at the same time. Mm-hmm. Really, the first person I met on campus. Can you who? 
<laughs> can I hoop? No, you said oh, oh, at the, at the um, panel, yeah. at the, when you were interviewing him, you were like, <laughs> that's the first thing he said to you. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty true story. It may not have been the very first thing. You might have said, you know, what's up? What's your name first? <laughs> right. It, it was one of, it's, it's almost always one of the first things. Yeah. Like me, though. Yeah. Is it annoying? Then, or I mean, since you did play, it, is uh, it less annoying? <laughs> I guess it's not really annoying. Mm-hmm. But people can make it annoying, but that's really just more individual person. Right. But generally, it's, it's, it's you know, start a conversation. Yeah. You know, we were good friends. We were roommates in our last, I think our last year there mm-hmm. at USC. And even before we were roommates, we were talking about Crete. Mm-hmm. You know, after we graduated, uh, he started doing Fruitvale pretty, pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. But I would go up there. He lives in the Bay Area still. Mm-hmm. Right after school, he moved right, right back. But I would go up there for like Thanksgiving with his family. I did that like two or three years, and then we wrote the movie. And you know, we still talk, we still ca- catch each other up when yeah. you know, life events and things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he's so he was so busy the last four years. You know what I mean? <laughs> just, yeah, he's busy. <laughs> yeah, I I'll just shoot a you know a funny TikTok to him, <laughs> and you know he he'll crack up, and you know mm-hmm. he might shoot me one. Yeah. And I'll be like I'll be like all right, man. Well, you know. I'll holler at you later, man. We'll kind of forever. You know, I know you're busy. <laughs> I see him about every, every. I would say every fifth time he comes to L.A. He comes to yeah. L.A. or not now to finish the movies and stuff. But yeah. when they're not having a promotion cycle and they're just like in development or something, he comes to L.A. We usually connect, you know, get breakfast or something. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your journey after USC? Uh, so we, I graduated 2011. Mm-hmm. And um, I was working. Well, I ended up getting a job at at, at an Apple store in Orange County. Mm-hmm. And a buddy of mine lived down there. A guy I went to undergrad with. His brother was in the reserves, which means for him, the res- there's an army base in San Diego. So if you're in the reserves, that's where you go for your once a week or once a month thing. Yeah. Two two weeks two weeks a year, whatever mm-hmm. it was. So my guy from undergrad moved in with his brother, who lived in Orange County. Mm-hmm. And then after school, I moved in with them. I was mm-hmm. on the futon mm-hmm. for a couple of years, but working at an Apple store. And I knew one trajectory I was trying to follow was we had the writers from Modern Family talk at USC. Mm-hmm. And they were all like, yeah, I did comedy. I did improv before this job. Like, that's how I met people and stuff. So I was mm-hmm. like, oh, okay. So I started doing like some stand up and improv. Mm-hmm. To meet people in the comedy scene, which was great. And yeah continues to be hugely beneficial because I'm writing a show with all these buddies I did yeah. improv with now. But anyway, so I was doing that and working and also working some security jobs at the time. Um, and then I was at Go by Apple and I was just working security because I had moved back to L.A. So it was kind of just too hard to go between L.A. and the Apple store in like Brea, which is pretty far in Orange County that I was yeah. doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was working a lot of security and we were developing Creed on Google Docs <laughs> and talking about it, but yeah. then Ryan was doing Fruitvale. So, you know, Creed was on hold, obviously, obviously. Mm-hmm. But then after he was like, man, you still want to do that boxing movie? And I was like, for real? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, <laughs> like, oh, we just writing it? He's like, nah, 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 nah. Um, I had a meeting with Stallone and, um, you know, they're talking to him. So it's like, we might really be doing this movie. And I was like, Oh, wow, because that whole time, like yeah. I said, my plan B is always going to be about how I could still write and learn. So yeah. while I'm working and doing the comedy thing, I'm writing all these spec scripts and just trying to be a better writer. Yeah. So then Creed came around about 20, 2013 is when it was being talked about realistically. Yeah. And then we started writing 2014. So that's just three years out of out of film school. Mm-hmm. So that was just three years of just being broke. <laughs> 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 you know, but hustling and making friends and having yeah. some fun. Then we did Creed, wrote in 2014, shot, and it came out 2015. Movies don't really happen that fast usually. Yeah. But obviously this one did. And that was really my journey to get in the industry. Mm-hmm. And after that, it was just a lot of meetings around town. I mean, I, I could get more into that, but it's more industry specific. Mm-hmm. But it just led to the jobs that I mentioned in different ways. And, and, and then it's just about kind of keeping your head above water in a way. Yeah. It's like, is there work? Can I consistently find work? And and also juggling that with the opportunities that are coming, because some are great and some aren't, you know. But I I would say like I had grad school was an introduction to making stuff. Then Creed was like another kind of grad school of like this is how something is made. Yeah. 
but then I would say 20 after Creed 2016 to about 2019 was a grad school and this is how the industry works yeah and I was in a unique position because the movie was so successful that I was at a lot of high level meetings and with a lot of established people mm-hmm. where usually you know your first project isn't like that yeah so you're coming in from the bottom and you're having meetings with junior execs and things not, not that any of this is good or bad and it, it all pays off right but I was kind of seeing it from both ends so I was getting mm-hmm. a unique I would say a unique point of view of the industry and how things work yeah and then after that you know it's not like things were about to take off and then COVID hit but it was definitely like I was figuring out the industry and like seeing things yeah and then COVID hit yeah <laughs> And this show, Grand Crew, was supposed to, we were actually going to shoot the pilot the Monday that that lockdown started. Mm. So, like, it was, like, that Thursday or the week before was when the NBA guy had touched all the mics. Yeah. And everybody was like, come on, man. Yeah. And then it spread. And then, like, Friday, it was like, oh, we're shutting down. Mm-hmm. Thursday or Friday. And my buddy Phil, who runs the show, he was like, we're not going to be able to shoot that pilot on Monday. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, oh, dang. And then quickly it was like, oh, dang. Yeah. The whole world is shutting down. Yeah. Uh, so that, you know, like I said, COVID kind of delayed things, but it's also not like I was, oh man, I'm about to the hundred million dollar deal. It was just like I think I'm understanding <laughs> how the industry works, and yeah, not only my place in it, but in general, a writer's place or a black writer's place, and yeah, and sifting through like what's a good idea, what's something that can get made, mm-hmm. that's likely to get made, and and understanding my place as an artist kind of the education that i missed growing up because i jumped into the industry very much like destination focused i didn't have a background of being like an artist that can dream and Mm -hmm. play around and i was able to develop that kind of through my jobs yeah so to be able to really call myself as an artist i felt like was something i developed later in life Mm -hmm. and then i was ready and then you know now i feel like all the schooling is done. The industry schooling, the how to make something schooling. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that's where I'm at now. And that's pretty much how I got here. Yeah. What do you love about writing? I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> uh, I think it's really more just the storytelling. And yeah. Writing is a vessel for storytelling. Yeah. And I never dabbled in like songwriting or 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 other forms of storytelling. You know, you watch like a cooking show and they're like, they're telling a story through the core scene. And I'm like, okay. I, I mean, I understand that now, <laughs> right. but I don't understand how to do that. So right. writing is just my vessel for telling stories. Mm-hmm. And just coming up and I think that's really what gets my imagination going is just like the what if or those kind of questions. What if or what could be or, mm-hmm. you know, especially now, looking at things that we've seen all the time on shows and movies and being like, well, what's another interpretation of that? Because yeah, uh, just being black, you watch, I, you know, you watch things on TV and you're like, Do people act like that sometimes. <laughs> and you're like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, white people act like that. <laughs> but everybody doesn't act like that. And then yeah. sometimes you see, also see behaviors of people and you're like, do they really act like that? Mm-hmm. Or is that how we're all expected to act? Because that's how yeah. we see that interpreted on TV all the time. Mm-hmm. And I do kind of like obsess over that. It's like, even in my real life, it's like, what's my reaction to that? Yeah. Not the reaction everybody expects. And how do we show that <clears throat> more in TV? I think it's something that I try to explore. Even in, even in Creed, going back to that, <clears throat> there were just moments that it could easily make really cliche. And yeah. we just were like, well, what's like a different way to do it? A little more mm-hmm. grounded or... A little more true to our experience you know yeah sometimes when i'm watching stuff like obviously you know there's multiple ways to be black black people are not a monolith but sometimes the way white people write black people it's like there's no archetype of a black person that would do that right, right. <laughs> and it's very obvious when you're like watching it yeah i think i've seen people get caught up in like the language used for black characters yeah which is obviously a problem a lot of times mm-hmm the way they just have them talk, but it's 100% right. Sometimes the actions they take, I'm like, you just wouldn't do that. Or if you want me to believe that this black person would do that, you have to tell me like Why? something about their upbringing, like yeah. that they were raised in a suburb somewhere without other black people, you know? Yeah. Or something to just to like, because I just instantly disconnect from it. Yeah. Yeah. 
like with stuff like um like raising Dion and all this stuff like even if you don't whoop your children you still can't talk to your parent like that like, like whoa even, was he getting smart in that show I, 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 I just feel like the parent child relationship is not blackly realistic <laughs> like, yeah yeah <laughs> No, even if you don't, you know, have corporal punishment, there's still these standards in a black American household. <laughs> mm, right, right. Yeah. Uh, when you and Ryan were um, writing Creed, you like took uh, boxing classes. Uh, so, you know, sometimes we obviously think of actors getting deep into the experience, but I've, I've never thought of like writers doing so as well. So what was the benefit of actively participating in something you're writing about rather than just researching through reading. I think that's even more beneficial for him as a director, mm -hmm. maybe than for us as writers. Mm -hmm. But it does, I think we both had done it. You know, we didn't grow up together, obviously, but we both had done like karate as kids. Yeah. You know, you sign up at the local dojo. You know, I did it for a spell. Thing, <laughs> do it for a spell. Mm -hmm. And he had played high level sports. I played a lot of sports. So it wasn't even like, when I actually, when I was doing it here in LA, we were both in school. It wasn't for the movie. Mm -hmm. It was just for exercise and working yeah. out and trying to get in shape. And I think he took a, I think he came once or twice there too. Then for the movie, he did it just to really get in that mind state. Yeah. And so he could talk, him and Mike could talk about it because Mike had to do a lot, obviously. Yeah. And then they could talk about it in a way as director and actor to really make it feel authentic. Yeah. So, and, but you know, directors do, and if you think about writers, a book writer, for instance, you know, you got to research your your topic. Yeah. You either kind of had to grow up with it or you got to research so that you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. As far as the boxing, it was like, well, we understood the sports mentality. Yeah. You know, and then boxing is so individual. Yeah. Well, we had both played team sports. It was good mm -hmm. to like, even though I didn't get in the ring with anybody necessarily. <laughs> yeah. But it was good to think about that training as like that solitude of it, mm -hmm. just just pushing yourself, and and it really is just a battle against yourself. Mm -hmm. So, is there a difference for you in writing um, for movies, writing for video games, and writing for comic books? Oh yeah, um, mm -hmm. yes and no. <laughs> From just like a story, like we were talking, and how you create like the story or the premise of your story, it's mm -hmm. similar, but there are so many technical specifics for each medium yeah like in comics it's really about the page does every does the page make you want to turn to the next page you know mm -hmm. are you fitting enough in per page mm -hmm. and are you writing in a style that's kind of minimal so that the artist can shine you know you obviously can't use the amount of words you can in any other medium in a comic. yeah it's just not the space yeah and then in a video game it was interesting because it was a the nba 2k my career 2k17 mm -hmm. but you have to write it almost like choose your own adventure in the sense of you have to account for if a player is good or if a player is bad yeah if they win or if they lose so you're writing different storylines which was something they did before i did it something they continue to do but these kind of open-ended games have to account for the open-endedness <laughs> even yeah. in the story modes you know and then yeah tv and movies like tv you're really it's really about viewer attention Mm -hmm. So in TV, you have to have things happening at a pace that keeps somebody's attention. And in movies, you have a longer runway to play with. Like yeah. literally, scenes in movies are longer than scenes on TV in mm -hmm. the most basic way of looking at it. Yeah. And in TV, you're kind of like, you're kind of going like up, down, up, down. Mm -hmm. In movies, you're kind of going like a wave, like a slow up, mm -hmm. peak. and that, You know, it's like you're carrying the emotion longer. Yeah in a movie than in TV because each act break in TV, even if you're doing like a non-traditional storytelling where you're not having commercials or traditional act breaks, yeah, it's still about somebody only is anticipating sitting there for a half hour or an hour and they're anticipating a movie pace. So it's like, how are you satisfying, satisfying that? Yeah. What, what is um, my career for people not familiar and how did you get the opportunity to write and direct for NBA 2K17? My career is where you create your own player in the game mm -hmm. and you take them through a story mode where they start off as, in my story, a high school phenom, mm -hmm. finishing his last year, he has to choose a college, then he gets drafted, and it's all these storylines about the people around him and his goals to be great, the friends he makes in the league or, you know, from back home, 
as he's on his journey to be, as you're on your journey as a the player of the game to be, you know, a great basketball player, an NBA legend or whatever. Yeah. That's basically how the story goes, story part goes. So, you know, when he has to make his decision, he consults his mom and his best friend. When he goes to college, he has a college buddy, you know, and there's different obstacles with the coach. And they're like, you got to train because they want you to do all the other side tasks in the game. Yeah. So it's like, you got to go see the trainer. And if you don't, you know, your stats start to fall. You got to like, <laughs> you know, you got it's a It's a role playing game at that point. Yeah. Um, so you just follow the player you created his career to the NBA. How I got it was they actually just reached out to me after Creed. Mm-hmm. And Michael B. Jordan was part of that game. He was in the game that year mm-hmm. and in the story mode as like your best friend in the league. And just through that connection, they looked me up. I had some shorts on Vimeo and they were like, oh man, it's a you know, good tone and we like what you're doing here. Let's talk about, they actually messaged me on Vimeo and I didn't, that's not something I checked. Yeah. So I almost, almost missed it. Yeah. But I didn't. I caught the message and mm-hmm. called them. You know, they didn't really, they just don't operate by traditional means. Yeah. They didn't, I don't know who his agent is. They might not even known like exactly how to do that at the time. Right. Or they, and also I just don't think they care. They're their own <laughs> industry. They're just like, we, like, we'll send a pigeon. We don't care. You're like, pay right. attention. This is right. a billion dollar franchise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what, that, that's what I came together. They just mm-hmm. reached out. Can you talk about the film, uh, The Last Real Magical Negro? Oh, sure. That's a short film that I made um, playing on the trope of Magical Negro and also the idea of white uh, guilt or admissions. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's a story about a magical Negro who sees his power, so to speak, the ability to to help others, Mm -hmm. specifically to help white people get their groove back and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. He sees his powers dwindling as we look at the world that we're in with, uh, you know, our last president mm-hmm. and people feeling emboldened about things that are harmful and wrong. Yeah. Magical Negro is like, oh, what was all my work for? Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. if this is the outcome, everybody that I helped and he, he runs into people, you know, a guy that he helped who's doing the wrong thing. And he's like, what happened? Mm-hmm. And the guy's like, I'm, I want to be cool, you know? And so he's on a journey to see if he's dying or if he still can be, still have a purpose in this world. Yeah. How did you and your co-host, Aman yeah. Adumar, um come up with the Black Guys on White Movies podcast? And what are you trying to accomplish with it? Black Guys on White Movies. Me and Aman talked about it. We should just meet, not meet. We used to run into each other at the gym. Mm-hmm. But there was this other guy uh, who's since passed away name was Tariq Jackson and Mm -hmm. I should talk about it with him too yeah just the idea that most of the podcasts we're talking about movies if it's a black run it's more of a pop culture podcast and they're talking about mainly black movies and the impact of that which I listen to a bunch of them or or the nerd black nerd podcast so they talk about Marvel just in a general sense and they'll talk about how it relates to them as black people but it's a lot of just like Marvel DC fan yeah cast thing and I'm very much as like, you know, white, what we call white, that's that's not the norm. That's just a majority here. Right. White is exotic if you go to a place where white isn't the majority, you know? Yeah. So I wanted to look at white products. I just thought it would be funny, mm-hmm. but also have some depth to it to look at white cultural exports as culturally specific, mm-hmm. not as some standard of humanity or standard of person personhood or anything. It's like, no, you guys are a cultural other, like everybody else is. So we look at the movies from the standpoint of what's up with these white people? Like, what are they doing? What are they saying t- to the world? What are they projecting? And looking at it, yeah, c- just culturally specific. I'm trying to find the right wording to just be like, you know, these things that we've seen when we've grown up with, mm-hmm. that's not my default. Even what we talked about earlier, a few minutes ago about the reactions. Is this a white reaction, black reaction? Do these things matter? Mm-hmm. And that's where we look at the podcast is like even just what is whiteness or yeah. what are the divisions of whiteness? Really, even before we do the podcast and I talk about it, sometimes it's like you just see it everywhere. It's like a black movie. What's the black movie? Black Twitter, black this. It's like the opposite of that isn't the norm. Mm-hmm. Everything should have a designation. Black mm-hmm. Twitter. And then there's white Twitter, you know? Yeah. And whenever somebody black does something, they're like, oh, this doesn't look good for black people. I'm like, well, what about that? Does that look good for white people? Right. You know, stop acting like you're also separate from each other. That kind of <laughs> I yeah. got upset right there, but <laughs> you know, culturally, you're an, you're an entity that is yeah. doing a thing. You're not just norm. It's not just the standard human. Mm-hmm. So I'm really big on like not my default, not my standard. Yeah, it's just a way of being. 
Yeah. I like the the um term that's popular now, like we're the global majority. <laughs> global majority, yeah. Yeah. Um but also it's it's interesting to when you know, being on social media and stuff like that and seeing African or like Caribbean people talk about Americans like when they create the little social media videos and like Americans do this and and right. we as Africans do this and it's like no white people do that. Black Americans right. don't do that. <laughs> I ain't never done that. What are you about? <laughs> so it's just like this lack of understanding that like there is an understanding that sometimes to be American at least media wise is to be white. Like I I never felt the most American I felt uh, initially was when I moved to Korea in 2009 and had to say I was American over and over again because like mm -hmm, I can't mm -hmm. say I'm from Detroit I can't say I'm from Michigan because I have to be from right. like either New York or LA to for people to, to know where I'm from so I'm like yeah. yeah I'm just like saying you know either Migu Saram or like I'm American to other people and I, that's like the most American I've like from childhood to that point that's the most yeah. American I ever felt was saying it over and over again I never really yeah. felt American. <laughs> I, I totally. I just felt black. And, like, <laughs> and they don't know in other countries, the average person may or may not, doesn't even know really about American slavery and about. Yeah. Even any like of our... people in the diaspora, you like have to explain it to them yeah. of like, um, because I always, you know, I always say like there's this like privilege of being, even if you went through colonization or in the Caribbean, you went through slavery. You don't have this mental prison that Black Americans have um, because sure. you you got your country back. <laughs> we don't yeah. have our own country, and so um, to like grow up in a country where everyone from the prince to the pauper was like looks like you looks is like very you, yeah. powerful. Yeah, well, one hundred percent. We're the miracle children of God for sure. Yeah. And it's just most... interesting to just feel so like our our story is so singular <laughs> yeah yeah and even even europeans will be on tiktok why do americans do this and i'm like dang even though even the white <laughs> foreigners <laughs> even white foreigners will be like why do americans do this and you know if they have anything about blackness it's you know based in a rapper they seen or something yeah you know? which is fine in a sense but it's also you know art you know we're hit we're hidden amongst the world in a way. Yeah. And it's also annoying to read like those BuzzFeed articles where it's like foreigners asking questions about Americans. And it's just like, did you just meet one American and determine that we all do that? Because <laughs> that's not even Basically. an American thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be something super specific. Why do Americans eat ravioli with, uh, you know? <laughs> with mayonnaise. <laughs> exactly. It's like, no, that, that was just one dude. You stayed out. A student exchange at one person's house. I remember there was one thing where, like, um, they were saying, like, Americans don't spend time with each other doing, like, errands. And, I'm like, there are definitely, even with white people, there are certain sectors of, 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 um, Americans that's like, let's go to the store. Like, yeah. What, what are y'all even talking about? Like, yeah. Y'all just <laughs> not been to the stores? All kind of couples or groups, small groups of, of stores <laughs> yeah so uh -huh. to be american um you're a tiktok star <laughs> just, just <kidding. laughs> but what, what do you like about the creative outlet of like making your tiktok videos tiktoks i don't know it's just a little fun silly thing to do i think yeah it's a quick laugh it does even if you're not it feels like a community in in some way even if you're not like i'm not like blowing up on there or like right. making any money yeah from I, I, to the people watching i was being facetious <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh but it's just a fun little outlet a little way to be creative yeah yeah that's that's just, you know that's how i look at it. even though it is interesting like fun quick thing but you are putting something out there that yeah. literally the entire world can see like mm -hmm. it's on full display but even though it can feel like a very personal or even it can feel even private yeah doing it but it's it's totally not so you know that makes it a little complicated but mm -hmm. i just like to have fun with the tiktok or 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 promote the podcast yeah yeah what 
have you learned throughout your life and career that will be beneficial advice to others? Uh, man. On one hand, I would say, like, all the cliche things, find your truth in them because mm-hmm. they usually come from a real place. Yeah. Even though it's, like, cliche, we've heard that a lot when they're like, you know, find, find your thing or, or mm-hmm. you know, live your passion or (laughs) whatever but i think so many times we hear those things kind of like the things we've been talking about as there's like a default way to do that yeah but but there's not you have to find your place in the world and your place with a thing because in la you know after living out here i'm not just going to tell somebody like man follow your dream just do it it's hard and you do need money and and Mm -hmm. you find out that people have a dream but it's on different levels yeah you know, like I have my dreams and goals in this industry, but somebody that I met at a certain time or a certain place, like they may want to do a thing that I, but their goal can be different or yeah. even what they're good at is going to be different. So mm-hmm. they're going to head in their own direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think what I've heard a few times that's coming to mind now and that I think is good advice is the whole like FOMO or mm-hmm. trying to compare yourself with other people are things to hold, to hold very loosely. Yeah. Like when you can, if, you, you, you're going to compare yourself with other people, but it's not a direct comparison. It's not like this person did a thing. I have to do that thing. You know, it's just more like, are you staying busy? Mm-hmm. Are you staying creative and staying activated? You know, and yeah. then from a life standpoint, like, I don't know, they're, they're the fine line between like your obsession and determination and accomplishing a thing. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of this country is like a very sport mentality, mm-hmm. athlete mentality, like mm-hmm. Mamba mentality. It's like, yeah. I got to go hard. I got to be obsessed with this thing like every day and night. Yeah. Really only Kobe was like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like and he or wasn't Jordan. even <laughs> Jordan wasn't even like that. Oh really? Jordan was obsessed about competing in competition. Mm-hmm. Jordan didn't go home and be like, I got to shoot 100 jumpers tonight or mm-hmm. I get up at 5 a.m. He was like, I'm at the gym. I'll be mm-hmm. there a little early. I'm a, you know what I mean? His yeah. stories, even his stories like the legend of Jordan isn't like obsessively working it's like obsessively competitive yeah kobe stories is obsessively working he's yeah. really the only one like that mm-hmm. but you know he grew up in such a unique way like yeah. he just didn't have the social skills and what you find out in the industry is like you don't that's not what's required to have success mm-hmm. you know consistent work is better than obsessive mentality you know and you and, learn and, like because cause I was very naturally like my hard work will do the work for me. But then you realize mm, you need to go into your network. <laughs> you got to go into your network. And, yeah. oh, man, yeah, you said it. Like you have to do the work alone. You have to use your network. And you, especially if you're a storyteller, which mm-hmm. really we all are, even in other industries, mm-hmm. you have to have stories. So like you can follow and learn other interests and you can love and be there for your family. You don't have to be like the secluded <laughs> Yeah. Jerk that's just like, I'm just on my grind. It's like, that doesn't really. Yeah. I feel like the individualism is very white and American sometimes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And so, in my effort to not live in proximity to whiteness for the past several years, is like trying to think of. Because my thought is like, in sometimes in animation and sometimes in um, coding and tech, there's like this thought of like, this like white guy who calls himself up in, into a room and like learns how to code or learns how right. to do this. And it's like, how do we, when we do it, how do we bring the Africanness or the blackness to it and do community? <laughs> Cause I don't want, like, even though I'm an introvert and a homebody and all this stuff, like I don't want to do everything by myself. Cause that's not yeah. my culture. I think part of it, cause I, you know, can be very much introverted and, mm-hmm did a lot of writing, you know, on my own, which you, you need that alone time to actually get better at at your skills. But all my projects have been deep collaborations, right? Yeah. And it's like, you still have to make time mm-hmm. for relationships and that part of life, you know, when you get a chance, you take a trip with your boys or your girls, you know, mm-hmm. or visit family whenever, you, you know, you can and form, and form these new relationships. And, and in a way, I think some of that hermit mentality, that mama mentality kind of thing mm-hmm. also kind of implies like, a pushing away of other people and i think that's a part of it that i'm saying to not buy into so much you know yeah because you see time. do you see all the posts where they're like like i get it like as we get older you know you can't be with your friends and go out but it, it's a lot of like oh you know when i'm 
when I, when I have a friend, I'm gonna go away for six months and then we're gonna come back and it's gonna be all good. And it's like, there's the, there's this like continual messaging of like not having deep connections and like mm. we're just living our separate lives and in our own little huts of sort. And we, we can just come back together and it's all good. And it's like, but why, why can't we have some consistent <laughs> friendships and relationships too? I'll tell you like, yeah, the secret to making something it's more about consistency and with consistency you don't have to be like four or five hours a day yeah or like you, you work your job and then i gotta spend out a night grinding on this thing it's just like can you take a half hour to think about your project or mm -hmm. to write something or or to ideate to the next level or you know these things kind of stay in your mind and then understanding like oh a friend call wants to go to the movies it's like oh well yeah, I was just sitting here thinking about the project for the last half hour. Let me just take five minutes, jot down what I was thinking. Yeah. That's your work for the day. Go live yeah. your life. You know yeah. what I mean? Because mm -hmm. you're just not going to crank up. And, and, and people forget, like, any story you heard about somebody's success, if they told the story or if you're hearing a second, if, you, if you're hearing it secondhand, it's a lot of, like, oh, they wrote the script in seven days. But if you talk to the person, it's like, I had this idea eight years ago. And uh, you know what I mean? Everything is a long process. Yeah. Everything is a long process of a lot of revisions. Yeah. And to do the revisions, it's more about a consistency than a yeah. burst of energy or than a or or living secluded in a way that, you know. But at the same time, I'll also say people have, you have to have your own experiences too. This is, you know, yeah. just advice and because your writing could be helped gotta, by gotta going out way. of the house. <laughs> it could be. But you know, some people are still gonna like hold themselves up and I don't yeah. wanna like condemn that and that's an important mm -hmm. part of people's journey and maybe even if i go into my story it'll be times where i did that and mm -hmm. looking back doing that lets me know that oh when i look back i'm like i didn't have to do that then you mm -hmm. know it's like a lesson learned and that's part of it everybody has to go through their own journey so yeah that's really my that's really my maybe my biggest advice is like understand that you're on your own journey because even with my platform you know i strive to post a, a, a video every week um, I did it in 2019, I believe I did it in 2020 too, but like last, uh, 2021 and 2022, you know, it's dependent on people responding. And so, but, but, but I always tell people the consistency of like, even if I still don't post every week, I still post eventually. <laughs> yeah. And because I've been posting about animation for several years, my Facebook friends or anybody um, who's been connected to me for several years, I am the animation person. So right. they tell me about animation stuff because even if it's not obsessively consistent, it's still, I still have been doing this this long. Yeah, so. yeah. And you know, that's great. That's yeah. great. What, is your, what, what have you decided is your purpose in regards to like blackness and black professionals in like writing and entertainment? Just to represent, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, I think that as an all-encompassing word is really what I feel uh, is important for mm -hmm. me in my writing that, you know, that's something and also something that can be enjoyed by a family. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think we're, I think we're in a lot of ways missing like a certain kind of family entertainment mm -hmm. that I miss and not that I'm bringing that back or that I'm capable of whatever, whatever, but I do think <clears throat> I want to approach a lot of writing as like, well, this is something I can like have my mom watch. I can text her and be like, "Yo, check out, check out this." Yeah. But I could also watch it, you know, with my nephew or in a certain way for live entertainment. That's not like I don't know. That's just maybe nostalgic. Yeah, yeah. At camp, kind of was interesting to hear Ryan talk about um, not wanting to necessarily put violence in the movie, but understanding the the right. environment <laughs> like it that has to be violent <laughs> that he's making a Marvel movie <laughs> yes. got some action. Yeah. but it's like you're thinking as his thinking as like a father or whatever or like when he talked about being a child and watching certain movies and it, it being violent and like being scared <laughs> yeah 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 that balance violence is just different again when you're like not my default like we actually grew up or kind of around it or you know yeah. Mm -hmm. it's different than yeah. if it's just your play fantasy. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. um, what do you hope black writers are doing in this current landscape of like technology, social media and all that stuff that maybe you wish you could have did in college or, you know, back then? I think people are doing good things. Mm -hmm. What was the, uh, who are the guys, 
make the videos and they had a convention. What was it? What was the convention called? Oh, which guys? <laughs> the guys. Um, they make these NBA videos, like making fun of NBA players. Um, Artie but then they had a big. Or... Yeah, these guys. Mm-hmm. They had like a big convention thing. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, but I was like, like door tam- door <laughs> like... <laughs> Who who was that? Yeah, uh, it was like that's not familiar, but I, I'm not asking. During familiar. that the two thousand the two thousands, two thousand ten popularity of like Easter Ray, black black and sexy T V and all that type of stuff. Ah, uh, yeah. Even stuff like that. Yeah. You know, I think people are doing really, really exciting and fun things. So yeah. I don't really know what people should be doing. They doing it. You know what I mean? Whatever they're doing. Sometimes people are sitting down, sitting waiting and not doing stuff. So I do, do what think... they doing is I guess your suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that the younger generation also is realizing, well, this is what makes like TikTok and Instagram so attractive is that you can go and practice and get yeah. feedback from an audience and even mm-hmm. an impartial audience on your work. And I'm talking about forget like the trolls and stuff, just like yeah. people that are generally enjoying or commenting on your work. Um, but in industry are moving from like social media to TV or working mm-hmm. with a network or working on a movie. There are things. A lot of times, people are all like, "I should, you know, I should, I should have a show or this and that." It's like you just don't understand what it takes to do that yet. Yeah. So, younger generation just understanding that there's still a lot of learning to be done. Yeah. That's 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 really it. It in mm-hmm. a simple in a simple way. It's like you just don't know everything, and you don't know what everybody at levels above you has to deal with. But mm-hmm. they're taking things into consideration. Maybe the execution yeah. isn't what you love, but that's an individual thing. That doesn't mean that these people haven't earned their spots or that you could do what they do. Yeah. There can be so much pressure and so many things coming at you mm-hmm. that if you haven't seen it before or experienced it as like a staff writer or, or you've been on somebody's movie set or something, mm-hmm. that these things would totally just take you out of it. They could completely sap your, your energy for the project. So yeah. understanding that, there's just more to be learned yeah. on your journey, to, you know, towards whatever your ultimate, ultimate goal is, you know, or or just to having a like career. A lot of times people would say like, what's your dream job and stuff? And I'm coming off of Creed and I was like, man, well, I just did that movie. <laughs> dream job. <laughs> I'd be like, I don't know if I have a dream job, but I'm having, I'm trying to have a dream career. Right. It's like, I want to keep working and keep working on projects that, you know, I can really care about. Yeah. And that's really been my focus. Mm-hmm. And I think thinking about it like that, what your life, you want your life to be like, is different than just like having one goal. Yeah. Like, I just want to make this movie. It's like, well, for me, it was always like, well, then after that movie, you want to make another one. So mm-hmm. when you think about it long term, I think you think about how you need to act so that you can have relationships and, mm-hmm. and grow as a person and an artist so that your work continues to be interesting and people want to still work with you and want to know what you're thinking. Yeah. I have a concept that I put out in there called the black animation ecosystem. And, um, it talks about, you know, the people who are out there making like TikTok videos or, or being funny on Twitter and like, hopefully one day having like a pipeline of like, you know, how people talk about, um, like the the drug dealer who has transferable skills to be a CEO, like mm-hmm. the the TikTok person or the Twitter, you know, comedian or the Instagram comedian has the transferable skills to, you know, go into the traditional industry. But it still needs to be honed. But it would be cool to have a pipeline for that. You know, there is the ev- evolution of like um, influencers being in movies and stuff like that. So just the continual evolution of the industry well i think and if we can understand yeah like you said like a pipeline that actually can teach and give these people a, a, a realistic chance yeah i think some influencers get into movies and they just don't really have a chance to grow mm-hmm. in that medium and they're so tied to the social media which is also great like if you're making money on social media and you're one of those people yeah you don't have to do the next thing but yeah. also to do the next thing, it's like there's there's there, there's another process and other things to learn. Yeah. For example, a lot of singers end up not really being good actors, and people wonder why. It's like when your persona is so tied to a thing. Yeah. It's hard to act because you have to drop who you are to mm-hmm. be a good actor. Mm-hmm. And when you're so big in another thing, and at a certain point, 
you can't ever drop that. When the camera's on, you're like, I am this person. Yeah. And so when the movie's like, we need you to be like lower status, it's like, but people expect me to not never be lower status. So it's yeah. hard to like drop that ego. And I don't mean an ego in just like that sense, but really in a psychological sense of yeah. like, I have to present myself because mm-hmm. when you're on set and shooting, dozens of people are looking at you. And if you can't be bare when dozens of people are looking at you, which is hard when you're established in another way. So a lot of yeah. people establish in social media, it's like, this is my persona. Yeah. And it's like, well, this isn't your project. Yeah. This is some director's movie. This is some mm-hmm. studio's movie. We need you to be like yourself, but toned down or turned up or something. Yeah. That's not what you're used to giving audiences. Yeah. And, and that can a, be hard to maneuver. Mm-hmm. And a tangential point, like that's why comedic actors are better at drama than dramatic actors at comedy because of the timing. Mm-hmm. And my father is a professor and like in his... Um, I think public speaking classes, he'll do, have them do Abbott and Costello routines because yep. it's, the writing's already there. And so that's you just smart. have to work on the timing of it. And so, you know, that's why Robin Williams can be a dramatic actor because the, the drama, dr- drama is still timing. But For sure. dramatic with comedy, it's like you got to know when to do the joke and all that. Right. The training and, 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 the, and the instincts. Yeah. Yeah. So my last question is, um, if someone was producing a documentary about you, what things would you want them to highlight about your life outside of your work in enter- entertainment? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I'm, you know, I'm pretty private and really my life hasn't been... I'm not a person that's like, man, my life should be a movie. I'm like, man, my my life's pretty straightforward, pretty boring. Some fun things have happened, but those were not all career related, you know, but the other fun things are just kind of, my version of fun is more mundane, I think, you know, (laughs) it's like (laughs) chilling, watching the Wayans brothers, you know? (laughs) Right. Um, Yeah. A doc me would be, about me would be solely about creative process and growing as, as an artist Mm -hmm. for sure. I feel like it could possibly also be how you think in in what you're doing with your podcast. It could possibly be how you think about the world, maybe. Yeah, I guess looking at any individual person's experience with race, Mm -hmm. there's some interesting stuff there coming from my elementary school Mm -hmm. that was like all black, but all the teachers was white except Mm. two. Mm -hmm. Or really one, and one came later for like a year. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and and then going to middle school, which was like, oh, there's a bunch of white kids here. It's like 50-50 at that point. Yeah. Going to a big state school at Ohio State, and that's just super white, you know. Yeah. Despite, like, what the thing that they're being the whitest about is football, which is all black students, <laughs> you know, and just yeah. maybe looking at how I, how I dealt with and interpreted that also as a really big black guy myself. That's like... Yeah. Dealing with other, you know, expectations yeah, I know or stereotypes. Yeah, Love has talked about that. For sure. Just like being big and not being, it, your personality doesn't matter. It's just your st- stature that matters. You know, yeah, yeah. But we all have physical things, I think, that mm-hmm. too, that people like hone in on. Yeah, for me, like, you by. I feel like, you know, the obvious thing for me is to deal with racism and sexism, but like, I feel like, honestly, uh ageism is very 33 percent because i look 10 to 15 years younger than i actually am but um because people treat me as though i am 21 um and it's not it's not it doesn't matter what race the people are it's like they just see me and think i haven't accomplished anything yeah and so there's no interaction (laughs) yeah or you always have to like announce yourself like yeah some way to be like I'm actually not young or I actually have this experience. I'm, you know, you have to like yeah. it's, slide it, that into the conversation somehow. So people are Yeah, that was annoying. Like, um, because when I was in Korea, I taught English, but I also, you know, worked at an animation company. And so it, to come back, like, because I did that in 2010. And it's like, I always had this understanding of when I was networking, when I lived in New Orleans and, and you know, I, I don't really do it here, but. I just felt it was dumb that 10 years ago, 
I did. I worked on Family Guy and Cleveland Show, and I have to say this for you to want to talk to me. <laughs> Why can't you just walk, want to talk to me because I'm a human being, <laughs> not because I accomplished anything that you find impressive? Interesting. Yeah. Um, where can people follow you on social media? Uh, my handle is at BearCov, B-E-A-R-C-O-V, on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. <laughs> Uh, check the podcast, Black Guys on White Movies, mm-hmm. which is available Apple, Google, Spotify podcast. Mm-hmm. And then you can see the trailer to my short film, The Last Real Magical Negro, at AaronCovington.com. Are you going to do the um, festival uh, circuit or something? Uh, we're going to apply to a couple fests, mm-hmm. but I want to try to do a screening. If I can't pull that off, then we'll release it online. But we're, we're trying to figure it out. You know, I don't want to put all my stock in the festivals. Yeah. Because they're their own ecosystem that I'm yeah. not, I don't really know about, really. Yeah. But it would be fun to attend some festivals and to get some eyes on it that way. Yeah. But, you know, we'll see. And if things pick up this year just with different projects, and I might just have to do an online yeah. release. But I'm excited mm-hmm. for people to see it. We're just finishing it with the composer now. So Nice. Uh, so I want to thank you for allowing me to highlight you. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This was a fun, fun talk. Appreciate Mm -hmm. it. And to everyone out there, I want you to like so I know it's real. Comment and tell me how you feel. Subscribe to Soda Deal and sign up for post notifications to show your zeal. I'll see you in the next video. Peace.